learning, training, and education are probably the most important factors that determine success and happiness in life. Whether it's ordinary education, reading, writing, arithmetic, and all of that, or highly advanced training in some science or engineering discipline, or training in enlightenment and self-realization, the ordinary educational system has let us down. It doesn't teach skills. It only teaches how to give right answers on tests. So you wind up graduating from school only knowing how to get through school. And then you hit the real world, and it's another story. What is needed to rise above the current crisis in education, in leadership, in trust, and in self-realization is a new kind of education, not ordinary schooling, but experiential learning that teaches real skills. We cannot master a subject without doing it. And we cannot do the subject without being it. That's where our Western philosophy has let us down. Descartes' idea of, I think, therefore I am, is completely backwards. The Cartesian split between the mind and the body, between knowledge and action, is completely wrong. Why? Because real learning starts from being. We went over this in the previous videos in the Foundation series, and we're going to go into it much deeper in this series of Becoming Genius. Because no one is born a genius, or you might say everyone is born a potential genius. Well, why do some people realize it and others don't? It's simply because they are not becoming a genius. And becoming a genius, I'm not going to say it's easy. You have to know how. But once you know how, it's simply a matter of methodical application of certain principles. And we're going to go into those principles deeply in this series. If one wants to become a doctor, you have to enroll in medical school. You have to go through a lot of book learning. And then you have to go through a lot of practical learning. Finally, you have to be approved, evaluated, and stamped a doctor by a panel of judges, all of whom are practicing physicians themselves. The same is true of enlightenment. You can study about enlightenment from books or websites, but unless you actually practice and become an enlightened person, you will not attain what you're looking for. This series of videos is how to become a genius in any field that you choose. Of course, we would rather that you become a genius in skillful living and realize the teaching of the Buddha, because that will give you the greatest benefit. So what is skillful living and what is becoming a genius? Well, let's talk about it some more. So in other words, it's very hard for us to learn new skills because our idea of learning itself is backwards. Let's go over the theory again. Being and becoming. Becoming is the process of changing your being. Now, how important is being in learning and life in general? Most people think that having is the important thing. If I have something, then I can do something with it, and then I can think about it, and then I can know something, and then maybe being is in there someplace down near the bottom. But that's not the way it really is. The way it really is is that being is fundamental. If you have the being of, let's say, an artist, then you automatically know how to express yourself and you can think in terms of your artistic media and disciplines and so on, and then you can easily do your art, and then you can have the things that come from doing your art. Or if you're 
interested in leadership by having the being of a leader automatically the doing and having and so forth of a leader will come to you and with regard to enlightenment if you can synthesize the being of an enlightened person then automatically all the rest will be added to you in other words being is senior to everything else change your being and you change your life if you want to change your life if you want to learn something or become something then you have to change your being and of course the problem is we haven't been taught about being we ha we don't understand much about becoming these are foreign words to us because our educational system has buried topics having to do with ontology, ontics, phenomenology, experiential learning, and so on. They have put them away where we can't get at them, where we have no access to them, where we don't have the vocabulary to even approach them. And mainly they have been relegated to the graduate and postgraduate levels of education. So very few people get that far. Therefore, very few people know about issues concerning being. What to speak of becoming. Becoming is very esoteric. Really, it's only covered nicely in the teaching of the Buddha. That's why we source everything from the suttas, the Theravada suttas, which are the original teachings, the original sermons, actually, of the Buddha to his monks. Now, what is becoming? The dictionary defines becoming as a verb meaning begin to be, grow to be, turn into, of a person, qualify or be accepted as, acquire the status of. And the example they give is, she wanted to become a doctor. Well, again, if you want to become a doctor, you have to go through the process of becoming a doctor. It's not easy. It takes a lot of work. Anything in life worth doing is worth doing well. And anything in life that's worth doing well is worth becoming a genius at, becoming a real expert at it. And we'll define genius in a moment. But for now, try to understand that anything worth doing in life is going to be a struggle. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to require a very strong commitment and intense amount of labor and attention from you. So we're talking about becoming okay becoming is a necessary thing for learning but how do we become the Buddha tells us he defines becoming as follows Kama is the field consciousness the seed craving the moisture the consciousness of living beings is tuned to a refined property thus there is the production of renewed becoming in the future this is how there is becoming so the Buddha, as usual, <laughs> gives us a deeper view of becoming than the dictionary. He tells us how there is becoming. By tuning the consciousness to a refined quality. If you understood this statement, it's like E equals MC squared. If you understood E equals MC squared, you could go into the lab and cook up an atomic bomb. Huh? Well, if you understand this statement, the consciousness of living beings is tuned to a refined quality. You could become anything that you would like to become in this world or beyond it. This is the secret. And we're going to be explaining this secret elaborately in this video and the ones following. Now let's take a look at genius. Everybody knows the perfect example of genius, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was already a genius by the time he was 16. He was already doing original work in a very, very esoteric field of nuclear physics. How did he get like that? Was he born that way? Some people might want you to think so, but I disagree. I was also doing advanced work in physics at the age of 16. In fact, I was offered a full scholarship to MIT in nuclear physics, which I turned down. <laughs> but why did I get that scholarship? Why did I get perfect scores in all my college board examinations? 
I looked into this because people asked me, my disciples especially, my students, asked me, how is it that you know all these things? How is it you can do all these things? I can fly a light plane. I can swim and run. Uh, I was a really uh, highly trained yogi and other athletics. And I did so many things in my life that most people don't even start to do. I was an expert symphonic flautist. I was an expert jazz composer and so many other things. I wrote dozens of books and so on and so on. How did I do that? Well, when people started asking me, I gave it some thought. How did I do that? And the result is what you're getting in this series, how to become a genius. Becoming a genius is something you do. It's not something you are in the beginning. You have to cultivate it. You have to work to get it. But luckily, there is a method that you can follow. It's not easy. It will take a lot of work. And a lot of that will be dry, plodding, methodical work. But if you follow this method, I guarantee you, you can become a genius at whatever you want to do. So what is a genius? Well, again, the dictionary defines genius as a noun, meaning exceptional intellectual or creative power or other natural ability. A person who is exceptionally intelligent or creative, either generally or in some particular respect. And the example they give, a musical genius. Well, I disagree with this definition because it says other natural ability. But I don't think the abilities of a genius are natural. I think the ability of genius is cultivated. And it's cultivated in a very specific way having to do with the meaning of terms. And we'll get into that when we describe the four levels or four steps of the process of becoming genius. Now, we can define becoming genius as follows. Becoming genius utilizes concepts derived from the teaching of the Buddha and other spiritual disciplines, as well as advanced concepts in science, education, ontology, semantics, software, and systems theory to master any subject so thoroughly that it results in a permanent change in being, so that whatever you master becomes your spontaneous, natural self-expression. Now this is the natural part about being genius. By the time you become the master of a particular subject or activity, it is natural to you to act as a master in that field. You don't have to think about it. Huh? There's no planning, thinking, calculating, scheming. You don't need to take a break and say, okay, what am I going to do now? It arises spontaneously from your being. That's the whole point of becoming genius. So when we say a genius is someone who has achieved mastery in a particular field, what do we mean exactly? Well, the meaning of mastery is far more than mere mechanical or technical proficiency. When you master something, it becomes your being, who you are, your natural self-expression, not something you merely know about. Whatever you master becomes effortless to use. You don't need to remember and apply it. It becomes your natural, spontaneous self-expression without thinking or calculation. This level of mastery comes from our unique ontological model and experiential methodology. The model of being and becoming used in our course is derived from the Buddha's theory of dependent origination, Paticca Samuppada. And we're going to go into this in detail in our upcoming videos. You will learn how to use dependent origination to become whatever it is that you want to be. And if you want to master a particular field, how to become a master of that field. And if you attain that, then that field is completely open to you. Whatever you want to do, you can do at the highest level. We mentioned experiential learning. Well, what is experiential learning? Becoming genius will not be easy. 
because we will critically question your habitual ways of learning and point out what is holding you back. You need full participation to get the promise of becoming genius. You have to make it part of your experience. So in other words, when we read something to you or when we say something to you in these videos, you should view this video over and over again, by the way. And each time we introduce a new concept, you should stop the video, look into yourself and recall a time when you experienced something like that in your life. Or if you never have experienced something like that, you need to identify that too. If this is a completely new concept that has no equivalent in your experience, then you should be very attentive to it because this is something beyond your previous level of being. We offer a radically different approach to learning. To get the full value of this, you must discover for yourself the experience of what we present. The experiential method is designed to provoke you to transform yourself into the genius you potentially can be. In other words, I can't do it to you. You have to do it to yourself. You have to work out these ideas in your experience. And the primary thing that's holding you back is that you don't know the definitions of the terms that we're using to describe our method. And we'll go over this in great detail coming up in the videos. Finally, experiential learning is not merely knowing about a subject, but transforming your being into a master of the subject, a genius. What am I doing when I'm trying to communicate with you? I have an idea or a memory or an experience or a state of consciousness or some information that I want to get across to you. And I want to have a copy of the information in my head wind up in your head. How do we do that? We take a language that we both understand and I encode my thoughts into the language. The language is not the same as the thought. It's a code. When I say dog, everyone thinks of a dog, four-footed furry animal and all the qualities of a dog and so on. Why? Is the word dog equivalent to a dog? No. Although you have been taught that in school. If, if somebody asks, what's a four-footed uh, furry beast or the best friend of mankind? Well, D-O-G. And you write that in on your test, then you get approval for that. But no. Knowing a dog, having a dog for a pet, living with a dog, and so on. I should have used a cat. That would be a better example. <laughs> I like cats a lot more. Living with a cat is a whole different experience than simply knowing about cats. So if I say the word cat, it means I'm thinking of a cat, and I've encoded that thought in a word. Now, I'm going to speak that word, cat. It goes across to you. You hear it in your ear, and it goes into your brain and you decode it into what you know of cats, into your experience of cats. Your experience might be completely different from mine. Maybe you had some mangy old alley cat <laughs> who gave you fleas. Huh? I have a pet lion. <laughs> so my different, my different experience of cats is going to give me a completely different idea. And when I say cat, the general word cat, that gives me a different impression, a different idea, a different concept than a person who only knows house cats, for example. Uh, or uh, one time in India, I ran into a wild cat in the mountains. Now, this is a cat, but it's not like a cat that most people know. So my idea of cats is probably a lot bigger than most people's idea of cats. My experience with cats is a lot bigger than most people's experience, too. So when I say cat, I have a different meaning than most people will have when they decode that word into their own experience. So that's why we need to make such detailed explanations of everything. Because every single word we use is defined in a particular way according to our intentions. And in order for you to get what we're talking about, the same idea has to come up in your mind when you decode what we say. 
That means we have to qualify everything. We have to be very careful about the words we use so that you can get the exact same idea that we have. This is called duplication. And it is the principle of communication that we use to impart this teaching. Now let's talk a little more about becoming. Becoming is actually the subject of the first and second noble truths of the Buddha. There is suffering and there is an origin of suffering. And here is the origin of suffering in a diagram of dependent origination. It begins with ignorance and then it goes through all these other stages until it finally reaches suffering. So this is how suffering comes to be. But there's also the third and fourth noble truths of the cessation of suffering and the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the method or the way to the cessation of suffering. Now, even if you don't know about dependent origination, you're actually using this all the time. The Buddha got this theory from observation. He was watching people, he was watching himself, and how we become. And we become something at every moment. Every moment this process is going on, on different scales. Sometimes it can happen in a matter of microseconds. Other times it can happen in minutes or hours or days or weeks or maybe even many lifetimes that we go through these different stages and we become different things according to our intentions. There is a law, the law of dependent origination, the law of karma or karma. And this is how that law works. It doesn't require some external authority, uh, like a god who looks over your shoulder every minute and writes down whatever you do. <laughs> it's a ridiculous idea. <laughs> who would want to do that? No. The law of karma works through our own being. It works through our own brains and the laws of nature. It's just that Western science is not aware of these subtle laws of being and becoming. If it were, then we could easily turn this into a very scientific theory and prove it, which actually the Buddha has already done. So let's take this wisdom and use it to overcome the problem of suffering. Most people misuse the process of dependent origination. And so when they become something, it winds up in suffering. And when they get to suffering, they say, oh no, I don't want this suffering. I'll become something else, and that way I won't suffer. So they go back to the beginning, still ignorant of the Four Noble Truths, still ignorant of the laws of dependent origination and so on, and they start the whole thing all over again. And that's why there's reincarnation. That's why people go round and round, huh? Do it again. <laughs> we we'll go in round and round and go back, Jack, do it again until you're sick and tired of it. And that's when you approach the teaching of the Buddha. You say, okay, I'm tired of the suffering. I want it over. I want it finished. And at that point, you become a candidate for the Eightfold Path. That's why in our process of skillful living, we make frequent references to the teachings of the Buddha. Now, times have changed since he gave this teaching. And people's lives are a lot different now than they were then, at least externally. However, the principles of becoming are still the same. And so we're going to use these principles so in the beginning you can achieve satisfaction of being whatever you want, becoming a genius in whatever field you want, whatever your interest is, and attaining satisfaction in life. And from there, we'll go on up the Eightfold Path. So. For our purposes, for applications like learning and leadership, we're especially interested in this part of dependent origination, which we can call the process of becoming. Process of becoming, as you can see, begins with fabrication, and it goes through all these other stages down to birth. Now, this can be literal birth, or it can be the birth of an identity. It can be the birth of a self, a way of looking at yourself or life, a point of view or a feeling or anything else. For the purposes of investigating learning as a process of becoming, however, we will divide the stages a little differently than the Buddha did because 
His purpose was to bring people right onto the Eightfold Path. Okay, first, we have to cure your learning disabilities. And then we can worry about the Eightfold Path, because if not, you're not going to be able to understand it. So we're going to work on curing your learning disabilities using the Buddha's technology so that you can attain the success in life that is being denied to you by your miseducation, by your wrong training, by your years of wrong living and bad experience in this world. We're going to turn that around and we're going to show you exactly how to do that. So the method that we use in becoming genius has four stages. For any given subject, the first stage is duplication, making an exact copy of the source materials. If, for example, we're going to learn about music, well, we have to go to a book on music and then make an exact copy of that knowledge in our own minds. Or if we're going to learn about learning like we are now, you have to be able and willing also to make an exact copy of that knowledge in your own mind. And then we can talk meaningfully. Then we can have real communication. Then we can actually transfer the understanding that we have and the abilities that we have to you. And then you can exercise and learn those abilities yourself. Or I should say, teach yourself those abilities. Because that's what we're really talking about here. This is the method of self-instruction. The second stage is understanding. And I define that as systems thinking through logic. What does that mean? Systems thinking is a discipline of thought where one makes a dynamic working model of a subject in one's mind. You know, having duplicated the subject matter, then one puts it into a model, a working model, that works the same way as the thing you're studying itself. That allows you to predict the results of any action by playing with the model. This is how Einstein invented relativity. He made what's called a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. He set up an experiment in his mind. Einstein came up with relativity without ever going into a lab. He didn't do it by experiment. He did it by thinking. He had such a perfect model of the universe and the laws of nature in his mind that, at least as far as motion and time and things like that, he was able to model them perfectly and see, well, what if? What if you did this? What if you did that? What if you have something moving near the speed of light? What would happen? What would happen to time and distance and all these other things? And he came up with relativity just by thinking about it. You can do that too. The third stage is called analysis, the contemplation of abstract relationships. So we've duplicated the subject matter, we made a model internally in our own mind, and now we're going to analyze that model and abstract the relationships among its pieces. This is an analysis of ontological relationships, and we're going to get to ontology in a minute. The fourth stage is metacognition. Metacognition is the realization of a new state of being based on the information that you have duplicated, modeled, and analyzed. Metacognition is when the light goes on. <laughs> when you finally say, ah, oh, I got it. Huh? When your understanding transcends words and symbols and becomes a state of being, that's what it's all about. That's what we're getting at. And these four stages show you how. Now I'd like to look at these same four stages from another point of view. Again, for any given subject, the duplication is on the mental level, the level of words and symbols. Here I am talking to you, and you're hearing my words, and you're decoding those words, and you're getting an idea of what I'm saying just by the words and symbols, huh? just by the words I'm speaking and the symbols that you're seeing on your screen. That is an absolute necessity. Huh? If you don't duplicate, if you don't make an exact copy, if you make a wrong copy, or an imperfect or partial copy, 
of a piece of knowledge, you're not thinking with all the information. You're not firing on all, on all cylinders. <laughs> So you're not going to get the same result. You're going to get some different result. We don't know what that's going to be, but it's not going to be the same as the original. So you have to start from a perfect copy, duplication. The next stage, understanding, is on the intellectual level. This is where intelligence comes in. Modeling requires intelligence because you have to see, okay, this is the meaning of all these words and symbols that I've taken in and duplicated. Now, how does this actually work? When I tweak over here, what happens on the other end? What is the relationship of cause and effect? What controls what? What, what actually does the work here and how does it work? Now this gets into the next stage, analysis. Analysis is the ontological level. What is the meaning of these relationships? What is cause? What is effect? Uh, what is a major quality and a minor quality? What are the different relationships between and among the various parts of my model? And finally, what does it all mean? When you finally understand what it means, then metacognition occurs, and this is the ontic level, the level of being and action. In other words, up until now we've been learning, but when you reach metacognition, you have reached mastery. You have become the thing that you're studying. It has been absorbed into your being. Now there's no more need to think about it. You can just be it. You see, this is what we're talking about. This is mastery. This is being genius. Becoming genius, you have to go through these other steps. It's a lot of work. I'll be honest with you. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the lazy. You have to be ambitious. You have to be driven. You have to be passionate about something. Uh, find something you really love. Something that you love enough to do a lot of it. Because that's what it's going to take <laughs> to get you through all these stages. Unless you're extraordinarily intelligent and you apply this exactly by the book. Now, if you can do that, if you can go through this process by the book without questioning or doubting it, but just do it, you will find the speed of learning will increase by a factor of maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand, and the efficiency of learning will also increase. But most satisfying of all, the depth of learning will increase beyond your wildest dreams. It's one thing to learn that two and two is four. It's quite another thing to learn number theory and why two and two is four. It's quite another thing to learn abstract mathematics or ontology and understand why we need concepts like two and two is four. But what is the meaning of those concepts and what are the powers and abilities that come from having those concepts? When you get to that point, you're ready to have a metacognition, <laughs> which can't be explained in words, by the way. If you've never had this happen to you, it means you've never done enough of anything, you've never gone deep enough into anything to actually make it a part of you, to make it part of your being. You're not ready for your being to change. You're not ready to become a genius in that subject. But when you do, you'll know it, believe me, because it's an extraordinarily profound and deeply affecting experience. When I say the light goes on, I mean that quite literally. The mind becomes brilliant. It becomes effulgent. Suddenly you can see so many things you couldn't see before. And this is true of everything from riding a bicycle all the way up to complete enlightenment. So this is quite an adventure. Let's review a few things about becoming skillful. The process of becoming skillful is a cycle with three stages. Practicing, causing something to arise or to happen, in other words, doing something. Increasing, developing it by repetition. And finally, investigating, observing and reflecting upon the practice. For example, if I'm playing music, I'll take my instrument, and I'll make a tone, or a scale, or a chord, or I'll play a song. 
and then I'll play it again, and I'll play it again and again and again. And finally, I'll sit down and I'll reflect, and I'll say, well, is that good enough? Is that really what I want? Am I saying what I'm trying to say with this performance? Do I want to adjust things, uh, change the harmony, change the tempo? Uh, or is it good enough? Or is it, is it ever good enough? <laughs> These are the questions you ask yourself when you're investigating. Investigating is by far the most important stage of developing skillfulness. It means observing one's experience, taking it to heart, and reflecting on it wisely until you understand and perceive clearly all the phenomena involved in each step of the practice. This is what it takes to become expert. If you don't become expert in a field, you're not going to reach the highest stage of becoming that thing. To simply learn how to play a couple of notes on a, a synthesizer or program a drum machine is different from becoming a really expert musician. Learning to quote from uh, the scriptures is completely different from actually becoming realized like a Buddha. These are very different levels of advancement. You should not remain content with a superficial understanding of whatever it is. If you're going to become a leader, for example, become a leader of such power and depth that you don't require any position in an organization. In fact, organizations will evolve around you simply by your presence, simply by your being. Look at the Buddha. The Buddha gave up his position as a prince. He was offered leadership in two very important spiritual organizations. He turned that down as well. And he went off by himself and he figured out by himself how to attain Buddhahood. And he did it. And now look, there are whole countries that are run by Buddhism. There are whole, and in the past there was a whole empire in India, uh, the empire of the Emperor Ashoka, that was run according to Buddhist laws. Buddha himself had no position, wanted no position. But he was one of the greatest leaders in history, or Jesus Christ, or Mohammed, or any of the great innovators in science or anything. They had no position. They had no title. They had no organization. Einstein was just a kid working as a patent clerk. But because he was such a great scientist, because he was a great leader in his field, a whole discipline of relativity and atomic physics and so on grew up around him. That's the kind of leadership we're talking about. That's the depth of skill that we're aiming for. And we don't want to accept anything less, and neither should you. Now, finally, I just want to review a little bit about skillful living. The process of becoming skillful should especially be applied to foundational knowledge. Skillful living provides foundational knowledge of human life and beingness as well as techniques for developing that knowledge to a high degree of skillfulness. Foundational knowledge is defined as follows. It aims at the extinction of the suffering, unsatisfactoriness, and imperfection of every experience or state of being in the world. It has an intrinsic truth that you can see and experience for yourself without having to rely on authority, tradition, logic, philosophy, hearsay and rumor, common sense, preconceived ideas, the social status of the presenter, or because you consider yourself a student of the presenter. These are all dangerous assumptions because they can lead you to accept an idea on belief, on faith alone, without testing it, without examining the assumptions behind it, without experiencing it for yourself. Real learning only comes from experience. Book learning is just the appetizer. Uh, I'm not saying it's not important. It is. But book learning is just the prelude to actual learning because learning requires growth of being. And this is the thing that ordinary education has ruined in everybody that I know because ordinary education allows you to become so-called learned person with a degree and all kinds of letters after your name without changing your being. And so they cheat us.
They don't force us to grow. And the hardest thing about spiritual teaching, in my experience, is getting students out of this habit and actually getting them to grow, to seek out new experiences, to seek out new ways of being, and develop them in themselves. Because nobody can do that for you. It's like thinking for yourself. Nobody can teach you to think for yourself. <laughs> nobody can really can teach you to roller skate. Maybe they can set up conditions where you're motivated to learn for yourself. That's the best they can do. And that's the best I can do by making these videos or by our apprenticeship program. You can become situated in a situation that motivates you to actually learn, to actually change your being. But that's the best we can do. We can't communicate to you what a metacognition is. I mean, we can talk about it, but we can't actually give it to you by talking about it because it can't be spoken in words. It can only be experienced. When you experience it, you'll know it. And you'll say, whoa, you mean I went through you know, 12 years of school or 16 years of school or whatever it was, and I never had an experience like this. I never had a growing experience where I learned something about life so profoundly, so deeply. You can come here to Sri Lanka and go in a temple and study Buddhism for years and years and never have a metacognition about it. It's quite possible. That's because academic learning does not give growth of being. So from the beginning, we are stressing growth in being, becoming. And in that way, we'll get you really ready to have a metacognition, to bring yourself to realization of the subject matter and become genius. Now, I just want to say a few words about the Skillful Living Network. Skillful Living is also a social network of exceptionally able creative people, community leaders, and consultants in every important field. You can qualify for access to this network by successfully completing our online video courses. And I'll describe those courses in just a minute. What you can do with the resources available through Skillful Living Network is limited only by your imagination and resourcefulness. We do not impose any limitations on the application of our advanced human technology. The only requirement is that network members deal with one another with skill, and integrity. And integrity is so important to us that we have a whole course just on that alone. Because without integrity, we won't let you into our advanced courses <laughs> until you can demonstrate integrity. And we will test you. You will not be allowed to access the advanced materials. Why? It's like giving a machine gun to a six-year-old. Giving advanced knowledge to someone without the character to wield it properly is just foolishness. Giving advanced technology to a person with the emotional maturity of a five-year-old, uh, which certainly describes most uh, military types and, and politicians, is just asking for trouble. So we're not going to do that. You have to get through the integrity filter before we'll give you our most powerful technology. And you have to get through the learning process, the learning course, before you'll be able to learn integrity as an experience. So that's why the order of the courses, the Skillful Living courses, begin with the Foundation Series, which you should have already watched. And if you haven't, there's a link. If you click on the words Foundation Series, there's a link in the video that goes to the playlist of those three videos. They discuss the Buddhist theory of being and becoming, or at least they introduce it. And they give you an idea about the methods that we use and why we use them. Then there's this course, Becoming Genius. Becoming Genius gives you the ability to self-instruct in any skill, to teach yourself any skill at a high level of professional activity. You can make original contributions to any field that you learn using our methods because you will become a master of that field using our technology of being and becoming. The next one is being integrity. Being integrity, as I mentioned, is a prerequisite to learning our leadership technology, which is very advanced, very powerful. 
But without integrity, we don't want anyone to have that. <laughs> Leading by being is our thought leadership without authority. Our course gives you the ability to start any kind of movement, any kind of popular, esoteric, spiritual, or social movement that you like. And it does not require that you have a position in any organization. In fact, to really innovate in today's world can only happen if you don't have any position in an existing organization. This is the technology that allows you to bring a new possibility into being. And this is the most exciting thing I think I've ever learned in my life. It allowed me to attain enlightenment. Simply by using our technology, teach yourself anything, teach another person anything, or create something new, create something better. Instead of complaining about the way this field or that field is going astray, do it better. And you can do it better if you know how to become the kind of leader that's required to do that. And finally, our master's course is called The Luminous Mind. And this is a course in Buddhism specifically the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. Our ultimate aim is to innovate leadership in the path of the Buddha, to bring into being a new kind of Buddhism, or actually the, the original Buddhism, <laughs> but presented in a way that's more appropriate for today's world. And so we want to create a group of leaders who are capable of presenting Buddhism in today's world in an effective way to people just the way they are and not to uh, try to fit people into the mold of the way Buddhism was presented a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago or whatever but come up with a new way of presenting the same thing in other words not changing the teaching but changing the presentation so that people today will get it. Anyone who can do that will own the 21st and the 22nd centuries, at least in terms of influence, because what's missing today is an actual spiritual path that doesn't cheat people. So our aim in all of this is to actually create leaders who can bring people to complete spiritual realization without cheating them without trying to change them, without exploiting them in any way, but simply to give them the best knowledge that's available, as far as we can tell, on this planet. And in that way, bring them to become genius.